So there's something we used to say on the playgrounds, at least I remember saying it a couple times, maybe you did as well. Finish it with me. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words... How many of you know that's a lie? Uh, I, how, how big of a lie that is, and the kids repeat that lie. I mean, the fact is, is that sticks and stones can break our bones, and our bones can heal maybe six to nine months later completely, sometimes even stronger than before. We can heal from that. But the fact is, is that some of us are still reeling from words that were spoken decades ago, words that were spoken over us that are still governing our lives, Words not only maybe that were spoken over us, but it could be that other people are still reeling from words that we have spoken over them. And now decades later, it's still sinking into them. It's still hurting them. It's still dragging them down because words have power. The fact is, words have enormous power. And if we, if, if we diminish that power, we diminish ultimately the, what, what God is telling us about this, what we're in today in James chapter 3. Verses 1 through 12, we're talking about the power of words. They have the power to bring life. They also have the power to take life. What, what, what do we do? Uh, so some of us are coming in here today, and i got to tell you, at the outset of this, at the outset of today, I'm going to ask you, do you have the power to give life with your words? Do you need to receive that? Because it has everything to do with the condition of your heart. But I also want to focus on maybe words that were spoken over you. You also now have the power to receive God's word, which trumps any word that was spoken over you, which overtakes any word that was spoken over you and heals you and takes you to a place of wholeness. So James, knowing the power of words, knowing the devastation that it could bring, really begins in James chapter 3. And if you've got a Bible, walk with me through these 12 verses. We're going to go verse by verse, and I've given you an outline that you have either on your, on, your, uh, on your smartphone, on your computer, or you picked one up coming in, and we're going to go through this outline. But here's what James says, beginning with verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Now, if you grow up in a Jewish household, especially in the first century, the highest thing that you could become was a rabbi. I mean, if you're, if you're a Jewish kid moving around, I mean, that's what you want to be. You want to be a rabbi. You want to be a teacher. You want to learn. You want to study scripture. And, and so when Jesus, for example, called the disciples to follow him, one of the reasons they dropped everything to follow him, because that they had this deep down desire to learn and to grow and to become a teacher themselves. And so being a teacher was, was high on the list. Maybe it's not high on our list today, but it was then. And James is saying, don't be so eager for that role because we will all be judged. He says two things, and teachers will be judged more strictly. Now, the first thing he says is that we will all be judged. Now, we have, if we have Christ, we understand that once we stand before on the judgment day, God who is judging us, we, we are forgiven of the penalty of sin. As we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. But the fact is, is that we're told that we're still going to have to answer for any careless word or other actions that we have actually engaged in. And Jesus makes that clear. And, and he talks about that. He makes it clear when he says that we will all have to give an account on judgment day for every empty word, every careless word that we have spoken, because that's, that's important. It's with our words that we proclaim Christ as Lord, that we receive him, but it's also with our words that we end up diminishing and damaging other people. And he says, you're, you're going to answer for that. And so he says, we will all stand judgment. And then he says this, teachers will have to give an account for more. Teachers ultimately will be held accountable for more. And why? Because faith, the Bible says, comes through hearing. And without hearing, people aren't going to be able to receive. And so, uh, so it's an important thing to teach, to proclaim the gospel, to teach this. And, uh, well, the fact is, is that so often teachers fall short. You know, over the past 20 to 30 years, I was just recollecting this week, the number of Christian preachers and teachers that have made the headlines for the wrong reasons. I mean, you, you look at it and they make the headlines for the wrong reasons because they end up failing morally that they end up teaching the wrong thing. They end up manipulating others for their own ends. And you know, and you, and I can, you and I can read that. We can look at these things and get soured on church. 
and start saying, well, church is full of a bunch of hypocrites. See, look at these leaders. Look at these pastors that failed morally. Look at these teachers that are teaching these things that are clearly not in the Bible. Look at the manipulation that's going on. We can either get soured on church and withdraw, or we can know that they will have to answer for this. And James is making this clear. We will have to answer. Teachers will be accountable for more. Verse 2, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. Now, a lot of us might read that and say, well, no one's perfect. That verse doesn't apply to me. So forget verse 2. You know, verse two, let's skip it over, Pastor. What does verse 3 say? But the fact is, is the word perfect is the word teleos in Greek, and it means maturity. It means to mature. As a matter of fact, it's the same word that James uses in chapter 1 when he says, consider it pure joy when you go through all these difficult times because that leads to perseverance, and perseverance leads to teleos, maturity. It's the same word. And so what James is saying is that when we're able to control our mouth and we're not at fault in what we say, we are, what he's saying, we are going to be mature. And he says, this is the goal for all of us, to get to a point where our words don't wound, but our words heal. And and you say, well, can we arrive at that point of, of maturity? Well, James says, yes. Jesus would say yes, but we can't on our own. We need the power of the Spirit of God in us to help us do that. And so then James lays out his points. I've summarized it in four statements, and that's what we're looking at today. Because our tongue can run and ruin our lives, because we're powerless to control our tongues, because our words are a window into our heart, we need God to purify us and fill us. We're going to look at all four of those things. Number one, let's start off with this. Because our tongue can run and ruin our life, you know it can. James makes these points beginning with verse 3. We put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us. We can turn the whole animal with a bit. So he's saying a very small thing like a bit can control a very large thing like a horse. Or take a ship, for example. Although they are large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants it to go. So think of this huge, large sail ship that is being steered by a very small rudder at the back of the ship. And he says that ultimately controls the course of the entire ship. Likewise, verse 5, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what great forest is set on fire by a small spark. So a small spark, here's another thing. He's mentioning three small things, a bit, a rudder, a spark, that can lead and control very big things. And in this case, a huge forest fire, a huge blazing fire, which is, which is started by a small spark. So the tongue is also a fire, he says in verse 6 a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body. It sets the whole course of one's life on fire and itself. It is set on fire by hell. I'll explain that in a minute. But notice notice the harshness of it. He's saying that hell can be on our tongues. It can. And it will flow through us, and it's there, and and it releases the power of hell once we speak the words that we speak. So he talks about a bit... He talks about a rudder, and he talks about a spark, two small things that control very large things. They can be used for good, but they can also be devastating if used for the wrong purposes. He says that's what the tongue is like. The tongue is very small in our body, but it controls the whole course of our lives. Uh, It's with our tongues that we profess Christ as Lord, but it's also with our tongues that we diminish and demolish other people. It's also with our tongues that we speak about other people, destroying their character. It's also with our tongues that we can build up other people, giving life to them. And so he says, understand the power that is in our tongue. It can be used for good if under the right control. It can lead to disaster if under the wrong control. So in verse 6, he says this, if our tongue is out of control, he says, it's because of the fire of hell that is propelling and empowering, if you will, our tongue. James is telling us that hell's fire will be on our tongue if hell's fire is in our heart. So the worst wildfire wildfire in Colorado history was the Haman wildfires. 
And for those of you that recall reading about it, it took place in 2002. And this, these, this wildfire, it was devastating. It killed many people. It destroyed home upon home and property in a devastating way. And if you read about how the Haman wildfire started, it started with anger in someone's heart. Let me explain. There was a fire prevention technician. Her name was Terry Barton who was angry at her husband, a estranged husband, who she was wanting to divorce so she could move on to someone else, and, and he wouldn't grant her a divorce. And so she went out into the forest where she worked, and she threw a temper tantrum and raged, and then took the note that her husband had written saying he wouldn't give her a divorce, and she burned it and threw it. And the sparks from that note created the worst wildfire in Colorado history. I mean, think about it. It didn't originate with anything other than a heart inside of her that was on fire with the power of hell. And so that's, that's ultimately what, what happened. James would say to us, that wildfire didn't start with a spark. It started with the burning anger in her heart, the power of hell in her heart. So because our tongue can run and ruin my life, because we are powerless to control our tongues is point number two. It's important to note that James doesn't give us a list of things to say and not to say. It's important here that James doesn't say, okay, here are things that you shouldn't say, and, and here's a checklist. Never say this, never say this, never say this. Always say this, always say this, always say this. Go into behavior modification and try to, and try to manage your own tongue. He doesn't say that because he's making the point that we can't. We can't possibly manage our own tongue. We can't possibly control the power of hell that resides in our hearts because it will come out ultimately in the words that we speak. Verse 7, he says this, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So basically, we're powerless. He says we can tame wild animals, and we have tamed wild animals, but we cannot tame our tongues. Why? Because on our own, we can't get rid of our own anger. On our own, we can't get rid of our own pride. On our own, we can't get rid of our own lust, our own greed, our own selfishness, our own envy, the, the power of hell that is within us. On our own, we can't do anything about that. And eventually, the power of hell that is in our heart will show up in the words that we speak. And so he says, here's why we can't tame our tongue, because we can't control our heart. We have no authority. We have no power to change the evil that lurks inside of us, is what he's saying. The fire of hell then shows up in the bitter comments. It shows up in the gossip. It shows up in the sexual innuendo. It shows up in the divisive and demeaning things that we say. Or it shows up in our boasting and in our cursing. He goes on to say, James is clear, we cannot tame our tongues because we cannot heal our own hearts. So point number three. Because our tongue can run and ruin our life, because we are powerless to control our tongues, thirdly, because our words are a window into our heart, verse 9, with the tongue we praise our Lord the Father and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth, he says, comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. So n notice what he's saying here. It, our words have the power to breathe life. Our words have the power to praise God and to build up others and to breathe life into other people even. Or our words have the power to curse, to crush, and to diminish other people who James says are made in God's likeness. Our words have this kind of power. We have this kind of power within us. So if our words have the power to take life and to breathe life in us, what do we do? Well, we've, we've, got to, we've got to look deep inside and say what's lurking in our hearts because that will control ultimately the words that we speak. I've got two illustrations from my own life. I, I wish it were not so on the first one, but, but it was. Uh, my wife and I, who love each other deeply, and we have, we have moved through a lot of stuff uh, since 1988 when we were married, um, we've, we've made it through some difficult times. A uh, few years once we were first married, we would speak very hurtful, hard things to each other. And those words were like daggers. And we would speak these things to each other. And I remember on one particular evening, 
Uh, I'm, I'm angry. I'm upset. My heart is certainly not filled with the Spirit at that point. And I'm speaking hurtful words to my wife. And as I spoke words to her that made her feel alone and unloved, I just watched the life drain out of her face. I mean, it was almost like I could see it leaving as I was talking to her. Have you ever done that? Have you ever spoken to somebody words that you know are hurtful and harmful and you just watch them before you? And, and that, that image is something that hasn't left me. Over a decade later, my youngest son, my youngest, Colin, is struggling with frustration and anger. And, and by the way, I have permission to share these stories. Uh, I used to pay my kids. If I can talk about you, I pay you. And for each service, you get 10 bucks. And uh, I, I said, Colin, can I share this story? And he said, sure. I said, do you want me to pay you? He said, no, I'm fine. Um, and so, <laughs> so he's struggling with anger when he's, when he's uh, just a kid growing up throughout the years. And we're wondering, why is he moving into anger and almost rage? And he would go into anger and rage, and I didn't realize it, but he would end up in an angry place whenever he felt like I was disappointed in him. And that was it. That was his trigger. If dad's disappointed in me, he, he, he became angry. And, and so at first, I'm, I'm reacting to his anger with anger, and I'm like, you can't do that, and I'm coming right back at him. And then at one point, I remember just stopping, and it's like the power of heaven took over in my heart, and I just started telling Colin everything I loved about him. <laughs> and I just started speaking all these words to him, telling him how proud I was and how much I loved him, and it's like life just overcame him. It, it, was, like, it was like the anger melted off, and, and he came to life. And I remember, wow. I mean, it was that, it, it was that visual. It, it was that impactful. And I, I know... And there's, there's no one like family that we're closer to that we can speak both harmful as well as healing words to, how powerful it is. And I've seen these examples of my life. You know, words have the power to steal life. They have the power to give life. James says this. He asks the question, how can praise and cursing come out of the same mouth? And then he tells us, he answers it. He basically says, because our hearts can be impure and can be divided. Jesus puts it this way. I've given you this verse, entire passage you might read on your own, but I've given you this verse out of Matthew 12. Jesus says, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Another translation says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So eventually, if you want to know what's, what's in your heart, just, just wait till those unfiltered moments when your mouth just starts speaking things. And then that, that will give you a good glimpse as to what's in your heart. Wait till the unfiltered moments. Wait till you think no one's listening. Wait till you think the microphone's not on. Wait till you think this or that. That's, that's when, that's when it's going to reveal ultimately what's in your heart. And you see, it, it's that way with all of us. You see, if we have anger in our heart and we haven't forgiven some, for somebody, and I know this for myself, if I'm angry with somebody, I'm going to start rehearsing in my mind over and over again the incident that made me angry. Anybody else like me? Okay, four of us. And, um, and, and so you kind of rehearse that, you go through it, and the more you rehearse it, the, the, the more it kind of feeds that anger in your heart. And then eventually, you wait till one of those unguarded moments and you start speaking those things you've been rehearsing. And they come out in words that are bitter and hurtful, maybe to the person or maybe about the person, but they come out. When we don't forgive and we harbor anger in our heart, the power of hell ultimately is going to control our words. Or in pride, we can elevate ourselves above someone else and we'll begin to think that we're better. And in our minds, we'll start to make justifications as to why we're better than our neighbor, or we're better than this person, or we're better than that person, because we don't do what they do, or we do what they don't do, or whatever. And so in pride, we start elevating ourselves, and at some point, our words, or the tone of our words, are going to be demeaning and diminishing of someone else either to them or about them. How many of us know that to be true? Or, or if we in selfishness start thinking only of ourselves, we'll not take other people's feelings into consideration, and at some point our words are going to be dismissive 
and, and uh, about them or to them. Or if we in our hearts are fearful and reactive. And because of fear, we're reacting, we'll not be thinking clearly, and our words are going to be distorted, and they will confuse, and they will discourage other people. Instead of building them up, it will throw a wrench in things, because here we are in our hearts given to fear, or here we are in our hearts given to pride or selfishness, or here we are in our hearts given to bitterness and anger. You see, our words will reveal what is in our heart. What then can we do? Now, what, what hope do we have? So let me revisit. Because our tongue can run and ruin our life, because we are powerless to control our tongue, because our words are a window into our heart, number four, we need God to purify and fill us. We absolutely need that. It's something every one of us needs. We can't. We're powerless to tame our own tongue. We're powerless to heal our own heart. We need God to purify and fill us. Verse 11, here's how James says it. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So what he's saying is we need to make sure that our heart, who we are on the inside when no one else is around, the true us, our inner self, we need to make sure that our heart is a spring from which flow healing words, words that are pure, words that have been purified, and we need to make sure that in our hearts we are not only purified but filled up by God. Uh, we need to make sure that we aren't filled up with anger and selfishness and greed and pride and lust and all the rest of the stuff, but ultimately filled up with God because what is in our heart will ultimately come out in our words. We need to make sure that the fruit that we're bearing is, is the right fruit. You know, when we speak words, is it producing the right fruit? He says, you know, you, you, can't, you can't plant a banana tree and grow apples. I mean, you, you, gotta, you gotta be the right kind of tree. Our heart has to be ultimately the right kind of heart to produce the fruit God wants us to produce. So James tells us, the fire of hell will be on our tongue if the fire of hell fills our heart. You're saying, Pastor, I still don't understand. Let, let me give you one more example in Matthew 16. You can read this passage on your own, but in Matthew 16, you get a glimpse into Peter who has at one point the fire of heaven in his heart and at one point the fire of hell in his heart. And you're saying, I don't understand. Well, let me read to you two differing, two, two differing things out of, well, the same chapter. At one point, Jesus is saying to his disciples, who do people say that I am? And so they're giving him all kinds of answers. They say you're this, they say you're this, they say you're this. And then, uh, and then he looks at Peter, and Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And you remember what Jesus says? Blessed are you, Peter, for, for you, didn't, you didn't receive this on your own, but, but heaven is on your heart when you spoke those words, because that was given to you from the Father. And so he says, blessed are you because God gave you that knowledge, that understanding. Heaven is on your heart. Skip ahead a few verses later. Jesus is saying, I must die. I'm going to go to the cross. I will be killed. And what does Peter say? He says, never. You aren't going to do that. No way you're going to be killed. And Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. And so he goes from having heaven on his heart to now hell is on his heart. And, and, and Jesus is saying, get behind me, Satan, for you don't have in mind the things of God. And so he's saying these things to him. How can Peter go from one to the other just in that short time? Because that's the way our hearts are. You know, P Peter at one point is filled up with God as he is speaking these truths, but then all of a sudden fear takes over and he starts speaking something else. And Jesus says the power of hell now is, is on your heart. You see, that, that's, that's the way it is. It's no coincidence in Acts chapter 2 that when the Holy Spirit comes on the disciples, the Holy Spirit comes on them like tongues of fire, like flames of fire that settles upon them, and a fire from heaven then begins to control their tongue and their words. You see, what we're told in Scripture is that the power and the fire of hell can either control our words or the power and the fire of heaven can control our words, and it all depends on what fills up our hearts. It all depends on what resides inside. And that's what it comes down to. So what is in your heart? God says, I want to fill up your heart. If you've trusted your life in me, I want you to live a life that is spirit-filled. 
And, and, you know, and I just want to give you a word picture, but whenever it talks about being filled with the Spirit in Scripture, it uses a word called pleru <clears throat> that is used, for example, in a sail ship. And if you have a sail ship, so think back 2,000 years because they didn't have these propellers. You either had a ship that was rowed by people or you had a sail ship. They would unfurl the sails and then they would have to aim the ship in the right direction. And once the ship is aimed in the right direction, it can catch the wind that then fills the sails. And the word pleru means stretched to the full. So think of sails that are stretched to the full because it's being propelled by the wind, and now it's just shimmying across the water because the wind is filling the sails and propelling the ship. So when it says be filled with the Spirit, what it's saying is this. Make sure your life is aimed in the right direction. You can't say, God, I want to do my own thing. Fill me up. We have to say, God, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to submit to you. I'm going to submit to your word. I'm going to come under your authority. I'm going to come under the power and the authority of your word. Fill me up as I commit to saying and praying, your will be done, your kingdom come, not mine. Fill me up as I allow myself to be aimed in the right direction and I unfold these sails of faith. As I trust in you, prayerfully wait on you, fill me up. Because if I'm not filled by you and the power of heaven doesn't fill my sails, the power of hell will do so. And that's what James is telling us. So let me just kind of wrap it up, taking you back to verse 2. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect. That word means mature. Anyone who is never at fault, does this mean we can arrive at a place of sinless perfectionism? No. But we can arrive at a place where God's perfect love fills our heart and flows through us. Where heaven is in our heart and heaven controls our tongue. And, and, and we need to arrive at this place, every one of us. That this is where we need to be because we know the damage that our words can cause. So are you, are, are you given to Christ? Are you His? Have you trusted your life to Him? Do you have new life through His forgiveness that He paid for you at the cross as He died for you and then He rose again so that He might give His Spirit, putting it in you as you trust your life to Him? Are you that person? Are you made new? Do you have that new birth? If so, are you filled with the Spirit or are you filled with other stuff? What fills you up? What is in your heart is what James is saying. So I, I don't know where you are. I don't know what you might have carried in here today. Uh, I don't know if the words that you even spoke this morning were demeaning and diminishing and divisive and devaluing of someone else, or, or if in fact heaven has been on your heart. But here's what I do know. God wants you to be spirit-filled. He wants you to take your life and aim it in the right direction, submitting to Him, and He wants to fill you up so that you're not going to be filled up with all the wrong stuff. So I want to ask you as we close, because we're responding every week to the book of James. Every week I'm calling for some kind of response, because James calls for a response. Do you need something today? Do you need to say yes to Jesus today? It could be you need to say yes to Jesus because you need to trust your life to him and say, Jesus, I haven't said yes to you. I need to say yes to you in what you did for me on that cross. I need new life. I need new birth. Or it could be that you need to say yes to Jesus Jesus, I'm going to aim my life in your direction, and I'm going to prayerfully wait for you to fill me up because I don't want to be filled up with all this other stuff. If that's you and you need to say yes to Jesus, would you stand and I want to pray with you as we close? By the way, I'm going to stand with you because I'm filled up with the wrong stuff as well. And while I'm talking... Let me encourage some of you more to stand. D.L. Moody, who started Moody Bible Institute, preached on being filled with the Holy Spirit over and over again. And they say, why do you always preach on being filled with the Holy Spirit? He says, because I leak. Um, we leak. We need to say yes. So if that's you, let's pray together. Father, we need to say yes to you. Some of us are standing, Jesus, because we've got to say yes to you for what you did for us on that cross. Jesus, you took my place. You paid the penalty for my sin that I can do absolutely nothing about. And you died for me and you rose for me. Thank you for loving me so much that you took my place. I, I surrender to you.
today. I, Jesus, need you in my life. I need that new birth that you talked about. I say yes to you. And Lord, some of us are standing because we need to say yes to your Spirit to continually be filled. Lord, it's so easy to get filled with the wrong stuff. Some of us walked in here this morning, we were filled with pride, maybe greed, maybe anger, maybe lust, maybe envy, maybe jealousy, maybe resentments. It could be any, any of these things. It's so easy. It's easy for me to start getting filled up with the wrong stuff. We want to be filled up with your Spirit. <laughs> Jesus, we, we want your Spirit to course through our lives and propel our lives and empower our lives. We want your Spirit to bear the fruit of the Spirit in us, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the gentleness, the kindness, the self-control that we need. We want your Spirit to produce that. May your Spirit do that. We, we want our words to be on fire from heaven. <laughs> Father, may that happen in us. Cleanse us, purify us, fill us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.